It's trapped deep beneath the Earth's crust, and for half a century, it's helped fuel mankind's insatiable appetite for growth. Modern society would struggle to function without it. I am, of course, talking about black gold, oil. <laughs> Today we're focusing on oil. What is it, where is it and what's it used for? And perhaps most importantly, how can it be used more sustainably? Lots of questions there that we will answer. But first, did you know that oil has been a source of energy since ancient times? Unrefined oil was used before the Industrial Revolution. In fact, it's thought that oil has been a source of heat and light energy for thousands of years. But it was in the 19th century that advanced drilling and refining techniques made oil available on a mass scale. It's impossible to overestimate the importance of oil in the development of human civilization. And it's quite extraordinary to think that something created so long ago remains absolutely crucial to our everyday lives, even today. Afia, you've been very busy with this topic. What's coming up in the program? Ahead on today's show. Many heads are better than one. We take a look at the environmental benefits of collaboration in Canada's oil sands industry. Underwater robotic snakes, Sounds like something out of science fiction, but they're real, and they're making oil exploration more environmentally friendly. Plus, we visit a refinery with a difference in Brazil to find out how you can extend life of your used car engine oil. And finally, the alchemy of oil. Can we really turn waste plastic into liquid fuel? As usual, we'll be joined by our sector expert to hopefully answer all of our questions. But first, some basics. Oil is the world's primary fuel. Worldwide, we consume more than 90 million barrels of oil per day. That's 35 billion barrels a year. Members of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, produce around 43% of the world's crude oil. Traditionally, we just drilled into the ground and hit black gold. But now, extraction is varied. There's deep sea drilling, fracking, and tar sands. From satellites monitoring emissions to amphibious vehicles, we travel to Alberta to see what happens when people work together. In unity there is strength, so says the proverb. Dan Wicklam agrees. As the chief executive of Canada's Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, better known as COSIA, he believes that the industry can only be sustainable if it works together. We have 10 members that account for about 90% of the daily oil sands production in Canada. And it was launched by the most senior leaders of these companies, the CEOs, as a sign of, of a personal commitment and a commitment of their companies to work together to accelerate environmental performance improvement. Alberta's oil sands are a massive source of bitumen, a material which can be processed into crude oil and other petrochemical products. There's an estimated 165 billion recoverable barrels of oil here, but extracting it can pose risk to the environment. Under pressure to decrease their environmental footprint, COSIA members are focusing on four priority areas, water, land, greenhouse gases and tailings, a fancy name for the leftovers from the mining and extraction process. In very simple terms, members are pooling ideas. To date, uh, the COSIA members have shared about 938 discrete individual technologies or innovations that cost about $1.33 billion to develop. We set a goal in 2012 to reduce our freshwater use intensity by 50% by 2022. And since 2012, the companies have reduced their freshwater use by 38%. The environment benefits and so do company budgets. By collaborating, oil sands firm Synovus says individual groups don't have to reinvent the wheel. A fundamental principle for our operations is to collaborate with other companies. We're trying to turn CO2 into valuable products and solve, help solve climate change. We want to leverage their resources, we want to leverage their bright minds, and we really believe that that's going to enable us to develop technologies quicker, faster, more efficiently. One of the main issues with oil sands is that the extraction is carbon intensive. The Alliance is working on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and is looking into whether satellite technology can gather more accurate emissions data. One of the things that the COSIA companies have done is they've launched their own satellite, GHGSAT. They call it CLAIR. It's about the size of a microwave. 
and it circles the Earth, goes over that oil sands reason about once every two weeks. And because we have Claire measuring, we can get more accurate measurements, we can get more frequent measurements, so that the companies know that the technologies that they're implementing for GHG reduction, whether they're working as well, or in some cases even better than they have thought. Back down to Earth and the Alliance has launched an ambitious CO2 challenge. Another example of a COSIA project is our NRG COSIA Carbon X Prize, where we've partnered with an energy company in the United States called NRG. So we're offering $20 million to the team that can best take carbon and turn it into a valuable product. Dan believes it's not absurd to imagine a future where oil extraction is carbon neutral. Our expert for this episode is Joya Falcone, Professor and Head of Oil and Gas Engineering Centre at Cranfield University in the UK. She has an MSc in Petroleum Engineering from Imperial College London. She was appointed leader of the International Geothermal Association in 2009. Joya, thank you so much for hosting us here at Cranfield University. You have an illustrious career in the oil and gas industry. Can you tell us a little bit about what it is that you do here? Thank you. I'm professor and head of the Oil and Gas Engineering Center here at Cranford University. I deal with research and teaching activities in the uh, fields of oil and gas as well as renewable energy. Well, obviously, we want to talk about renewable energy. And historically, oil has a high profile when it comes to pollution. Can you tell us a little bit about whether oil can ever be truly green? It's very true, the oil industry has a very high profile when it comes to pollution. Can it be green? Can it be regarded as greener? I definitely think so, and the oil companies are already transitioning into broader investment into renewable energy resources as well as oil and gas. So maybe in the not-so-distant future we will refer to them as two energy companies. As opposed to just oil companies? I think so, yes. Maybe you can tell us, you mentioned greener, can you tell us some of the technologies that are being invested in to make it more of a transitional fuel? Several oil companies have already started to invest in geothermal energy projects, wind energy projects, solar energy projects, and they're already making big investments. We're talking about deals in the range of probably $1 billion each. Uh, there have been initiatives such as the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative putting together 10 major companies committing to $1 billion investment for the next decade. Can you tell us about some of the technology with underwater robots, for example, on prevention and cure of oil spills? Uh, certainly, this underwater technology is key. We have been using remotely operated vehicles, ROVs as we call them, for several years in, in the oil and gas industry. Uh, they, they, they are there to allow us to monitor operations in areas where you couldn't really go as, as humans. And, and also you can do interventions directly to stop these pills. And that's precisely what has been done for Macondo. Well, we'll be hearing lots more from Joya throughout the rest of the programme, of course. But a lot of us may think we know about the oil industry. If you do, think again, because here's one common misconception. You thought you knew? Think again. Myth. Renewable energy sources will soon render oil obsolete. Fact, renewable energy may reduce the need for oil, but petroleum will be required for decades to come. Apart from history showing us it can take generations to transition to new energy sources, oil's use extends far further than energy. Oil products are found in almost everything you come into contact with, from takeaway coffee cups to clothing. Oil is, quite literally, everywhere. Oil prices have halved over the last decade, so when it comes to oil exploration, improving efficiency is a top priority. We take a trip to Norway to see how that can have trickle-down benefits for the environment. Currently there is a, a gripper tool in the front of the vehicle, which the robot can use to grab hold of objects. In this test tank in Trondheim, Norway, there's some pretty innovative work going on. Paul is co-founder and chief technology officer of Elum, a Norwegian underwater robotics company. Set up two years ago following a decade of research, it's a spin-off from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Elum has developed a groundbreaking system that repairs and does maintenance on subsea oil installations. The company hopes that snake robots will replace slow and costly surface vessels, making maintenance safer, cheaper and greener. Traditionally, they have used remotely operated vehicles controlled from a surface vessel. 
And that is a very costly method because the surface vessel costs a lot of money and you have a lot of people on board. Our vehicle is permanently installed on the seafloor, so we don't need to engage the surface vessel to do inspection and maintenance work. That reduces the CO2 uh, emission. With sustained lower oil prices, companies are feeling the pressure to find greater efficiency measures. And when it comes to maintenance, Elum thinks that its robotic-like arms are the answer. The Elum vehicles are ideal for carrying out uh, inspection and maintenance operations in tight spaces, not accessible by uh, larger, more conventional underwater vehicles. Uh, they can also carry out more typical intervention tasks, such as operating valves and removing marine growth. They can also carry out very energy efficient transit over long distances, since they can move like a torpedo underwater. And they are also designed to live underwater by the subsea installations for long periods of time, such as weeks and months, without requiring a human intervention and maintenance. Elim says the robot can carry out repairs with the same dexterity as a human hand. We are currently designing a new prototype with a depth rating of 500 meters, which will also be able to carry different types of tools and carry out different types of intervention. And the vehicle will actually have tooling in each end, so it will actually be able to grab hold of something with one end and carry out the tool operation with another end. It will also be able to provide a very good view of the situation to the topside operator since we will have cameras in each end of the vehicle. Developing this type of technology doesn't come without challenges. Even though our vehicle is flexible with multiple motorized joints, we still have a highly durable and robust design due to our solution for the articulation based on covering each mechanical joint by a bellows which is filled with oil to handle the pressure on the water. But overcoming challenges is all part of, well, the challenge. We have developed our concept at quite a high speed, going from a concept to a real prototype. And we get good feedback from the major oil and gas players in the industry. So it is uh, very promising. Joy, we've just been hearing from Norway a little bit about exploration and there's talk of 2050 being a date for peak oil. Can you explain to us what peak oil means? Peak oil is a, is a term that covers a bit of uncertainty in my opinion. Uh, for a start I could say that when we say peak oil, oil actually includes gas as well. We tend to convert the gas volumes into barrels of oil equivalent and then put everything together in that magic number that people call peak oil. Um, in a way, I believe and I don't believe in peak oil. I do believe in what we call the reserves replacement ratio. It's basically the ratio between the new reserves which are added to a company's portfolio and the production from the company in a given year. As we uh, keep depleting the existing reserves, we have potentially less left unless we replenish that number with new discoveries. Advances in drilling technology in the oil industry have already allowed the industry to untap uh, resources which before were considered as unachievable. I could mention, for example, horizontal drilling, I could mention monoboard drilling, I could mention casing drilling, I could also mention geosteering, which allows you to go deviated down underground. Um, and we've reached uh, records. For example, in this very same country in the UK, uh, there was a record for the longest horizontal extended ridge drilling uh, in the Witch Farm field in Dorset with a horizontal section of 10 kilometres. When we think about horizontal drilling, a lot of people think of it as new technology, but I know that it's not really, is it? Correct. It's, it's not new technology, it has been used before, uh, but we, we hear more about it these days in relation to the unconventional resources which indeed do require horizontal drilling technology to be exploited. Fracking uses a lot of water. What's the industry doing to reduce water usage to make it more sustainable in the long term? Hydraulic stimulation does require the uh, use of water and we have a large number of wells uh, to be drilled in unconventional resources which require this technology. The industry is already responding by trying to be more efficient in the way they perform these uh, stimulation jobs, trying to use less water as much as possible and also trying to recycle the water. It's a closed loop system. Of course some of the water gets lost on the ground but the majority of it does return to surface and can be treated. Also we are looking into alternative fluids. 
In our next film, we're going to be thinking about the reuse of oil. What can you tell us about the technologies from extraction all the way to utilisation to make the process more environmentally friendly? Environmentally friendly has to do with improved efficiency and recycling. We can improve the efficiency uh, of drilling the wells, uh, producing hydrocarbons from those wells. We can improve the efficiency of the process of treating the produced fluids and we can think about recycling such as waste oil recycling. Coming up after the break, as good as new, we visit a refinery in Brazil that's breathing new life into used engine oil. And we travel to Shanghai to see scientists working their magic, transforming plastic bottles into fuel. Still watching? Perfect. Click here to watch another great video from CNBC International. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.